Thank you very much, and it's a real honor to be uh, in this room. Uh, my name is Amjo Hall. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada at Simon Fraser University, but it gives me a lot of warmth and kind of nostalgia to be in this room because I studied here in Kusek in 2005-2006, so every time I think of being particularly in this space, I think of it as a, a place of, of, of thinking, and the last time that I was in Kusek was during the uh, Summer Institute in, in 2006, so it's almost been uh, 12 years uh, since uh, being here. Uh, what I'm going to do is to talk about a book that uh, I published with a friend of mine, a couple of friends, uh, that came out in uh, late March of this year. We've traveled a little bit with it to Seattle and New Orleans and Wisconsin, and, and uh, next week we'll be in Berlin to do a, a small launch there. But just by, by way of uh, a background, I come from doing inner city community organizing work since the late 90s in Vancouver. I've worked abroad in the Middle East uh, uh, in uh, 0304. I've done uh, coalition work, uh, raising social issues uh, in the case of Vancouver when the Olympics were <coughs> related to hypergentrification. And uh, after that, uh, was kind of in a state of uh, melancholy in terms of like the possibilities of community organizing, meeting political ends, those types of things. I've worked in politics, nonprofits, those types of things. I was really looking for uh, a theoretical space to think things through again. And this was after I'd been in the I had a chance to study uh, in uh, uh, philosophy uh, around social change and ecology. So my, my doctoral dissertation was working with uh, French philosopher Alain Badiou, who's, who's not really known as an ecological uh, thinker, but he kind of comes from that May 68 militant French tradition about what does political change look like and trying to bring some of those ideas together with the climate change uh, problem uh, today. And in um, uh, many senses as well, uh, the kind of things that we were thinking about, my, my friends and I, were how do we think about development in the time of climate change? And it wasn't really our interest in developing a political program or a how-to guide or this type of thing, uh, but to kind of think where are the stakes of this conversation and to maybe take a step back to think it through uh, a little bit. And that's essentially what we were uh, trying to do in this, in this project. We wanted to do uh, an academic book because we wanted it to be taken seriously from a theoretical point of view, but we also uh, work adjacent to universities, but we teach occasionally, but we don't view ourselves as academics. And so we wanted to play with that form of storytelling because that kind of capacity to transmit and who reads the work, is it going to sit in the library somewhere, and what are the different ways we can play with that. And so we decided to do a road trip to Fort McMurray, Alberta in uh, uh, northern Canada where much of the oil sands uh, is uh, it's a form of dirty oil. Um, but uh, it's not really a book about the oil sands per se. If in any of your countries or regions, if you have an economic development project that has environmental implications, you can substitute it in terms of the type of story we're trying to deal with here. It's a way for us to talk about development in the time of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, as well, we went up with um, a graphic journalist, uh, Joe Sacco. Uh, he uh, has uh, worked in various conflict zones. He did a, uh, a comic in the early 90s called Palestine in the Balkans, safe area of um, uh, He's done work on homelessness in the US, a uh, book with Chris Hedges. Uh, and he's currently working on a book uh, set in the Northwest Territories with indigenous communities there who are um, uh, dealing with uh, questions related uh, to uh, uh, development. You know, one of the things that, that came up for us in, in the process of it is that you know, uh, it, it's amazing how far colonialism seems like a thing in the past, but how much of us in the present day are still impacted by it. I'd be hard pressed to find somebody in this room, either themselves or in their family histories over the course of 20th century, who's not somehow impacted uh, by uh, uh, colonialism in, in forms of development. I think about in my own uh, example. Uh, my parents were born in what is today Pakistan. And with the colonial partition that happened in uh, 47, we're over to the Indian side with the economic hits and complexities, the loss of land, found themselves immigrating to Canada, uh, to a small town. My father worked in a sawmill. And uh, they moved on to a territory. And in the west coast of 
uh, Canada, uh, where indigenous communities have been for 14,000 years, uh, those lands uh, were not signed with treaties or anything. That was land that was simply taken away from groups. So it's part of a modern day land claims process that's underway. And this is important to the story that we're telling because in, in some sense these, uh, when we talk about uh, Fort McMurray, Alberta and the oil sands, those pipelines need to be taken out to the water because the new markets are out in Asia. And uh, <coughs> it's, it, it's in cities like Vancouver where I live, it's very easy to look at Fort McMurray, Alberta to say they're ruining the planet. And um, the, uh, when the oil uh, spills that are going to be in the water are going to affect us, somebody in Alberta will make the money or some oil company in, in Texas. So we've become very distant from the kind of movements of capital that happen. Uh, we had a kind of generalized um, <coughs> frustration at the discourses around uh, ecology uh, in general and global warming specifically. We use the title global warming rather than climate change and those of you of a certain age will remember in the 80s when we talked about these things we used to call it global warming and people started to doubt the science and it was kind of a step back to say oh it's climate change, it might be warming, there might be other things going on but the general trend is towards uh, warming and in fact we have 410 parts per million that we just hit a few months ago for the, for the first time. Um, and, um, you know, there are all these kind of conundrums and contradictions. We mirror these uh, weird bifurcations and we sort of change performatively. We're like, there's a crisis, we need to do something, but in day-to-day -day life we recycle a little bit, we do a little bit here and there, but in general, we don't really change that much. There's a general kind of orientation to <coughs> uh, what's happening. And we didn't want it to sort of talk through our own hypocrisies in that way um, uh, as well. Uh, there's also this sense that uh, every few years or so, diplomats who represent us are going to go to Copenhagen or Paris and strike some sort of grand consensus on climate change, and then the world will be saved. And, and you know, NGOs send out the petitions that we sign, but you know, be it in Copenhagen or Paris or wherever the next summit is going to be, uh, this kind of delegated authority to a kind of global uh, consensus never really quite uh, materializes. Uh, and so we, um, uh, one of the, the challenges is that um, we have a prime minister in Canada who's generally viewed uh, in global sense as a kind of uh, a progressive leader. We have a gender parity cabinet, we have visible minorities in cabinet, we have a Sikh defense minister who has a turban, we have a former immigrant who's the immigration minister. In terms of the generalized orientation directions of the world, we're, we're very, very progressive. But when it comes to talking about the oil sands in Alberta, uh, one of the quotes that Justin Trudeau says is that there isn't a country in the world that would find billions of barrels of oil and leave it in the ground while there's still a market for it. And so one of the challenges with that, it, 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 all the possibilities of transformative change that we're talking about, the air just completely leaves the room. It's like we have no choice. And in the, the context of the oil sands in Vancouver, this was a, a pipeline owned by Kinder Morgan, a Texas-based oil company. And as there started becoming volatility in the markets due to protests from environmentalists and indigenous peoples, um, they wanted to leave that pipeline and the federal government has now nationalized it and has taken on all of the, the risk uh, attached to it. Uh, the Canadian banking system, which is generally viewed as fairly stable and highly regulated, is uh, highly exposed uh, in the oil sands. So there is a kind of general economic inertia uh, behind uh, this, this project as well. So one of the, the things that we talk about in the book is that we're trying to link um, the domination of nature by human beings is predicated by the, by the domination of people by people. We can't have the domination of nature without the domination of people by people. It's, it's uh, predicated in that inequality uh, that we have some of the environmental uh, issues that we have today, the kind of enlightenment idea that human beings are uh, going to somehow tame or master the earth. Uh, the kind of questions that's going on in, in, in ecological philosophy around how do we decenter the human being uh, 
and move towards these complex uh, systems and how do we live with a harmony of nature. So we do talk a lot about how this relationship to land that indigenous people talk about, there's many, many traditions that have this about a way of being in the world that has a relationship to land and a different idea of what development might be. And for us, uh, we, we use the term uh, a decolonization at the center of thinking about land and thus ecology, it opens up possibilities for all of us, not just in a nostalgic sense, but in a resurgent uh, sense. And uh, we look at some of the literature going back, this is not really a new idea in some way. There was an indigenous leader in Canada named George Manuel who in the early 70s, there was a lot of discussions happening between indigenous communities and decolonized nation movements uh, in, in Africa and Tanzania, which is where the term the fourth world uh, was coined. Uh, there's going to be a reprinting of that book by University of Minnesota Press uh, early uh, next year. I'm going to show a few photos here. Uh, so part of our project, uh, rather than write a purely theoretical uh, book, was to actually fly to Edmonton, which is a city in northern Alberta. We rented a big uh, a sport utility vehicle that's probably not very good on gas. And we drove up uh, north uh, to a community of about 80,000 people. And uh, there, people make their livings uh, in uh, working and extracting oil. And in, if you know a little bit about Fort McMurray, uh, it's, it's a kind of dirty oil, it's diluted bitumen, and so it requires three times the water resources to extract it, to heat it, and so it's a particularly uh, in inefficient way to gather oil, and as fracking has increased in the United States and other parts of the world, the cost of producing this oil is much higher, so there's a kind of like crisis around <coughs> work and employment and the possibility of this uh, continuing on um, uh, into the future. Um, and it's very easy to go up to a place like Fort McMurray and, and organi news organizations like Vice and others, The Guardian, they go up there and they talk about this place as kind of like, you know, if we're going to uh, 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 die as a civilization, Fort McMurray and what's happening there is one of the pieces of that puzzle. And that's not the story we were looking to tell because it's almost, it's too easy a story to tell just because of the scale of the infrastructure, uh, the camps, the ACO trailers, uh, this a community of 80,000 people that can balloon up to 100 and 120,000 uh, when it's uh, going fully. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, with uh, friends as well there. Uh, uh, my friend Matt who I was writing with, uh, his daughter had gone there to work in a bar to uh, save money to go to nursing school. So some of the interviews in the books that we do is what is it that drives labor and people to these types of places? Uh, what are the the um, uh, uh, challenges in their own economic life that forces people into these things. Because in some ways, if we're going to talk about uh, climate change, we can't just uh, talk about the problems of Fort McMurray uh, if we don't have an alternative to present to the people that are forced to be in those positions. And it's very easy to say that everybody drives a monster truck in Fort McMurray, Alberta, that they're not ecologically uh, evolved. But when you actually go there, what you find is a deeply multicultural community. Uh, everybody is there to make money for sure, but this is uh, in that part of northern Canada you don't see a diverse community of Africans, of Muslims, of South Asians um, uh, who are all trying to make, um, uh, 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 make life in a community that could be anywhere in the world. And so in some sense when we uh, leave them out of the conversation or we take out that piece of it, it's very hard to get to the other side of some kind of a, a solution. This is just some of the infrastructure, and there's actually a, a, a museum there that they've set up to show all the different types of, of uh, machinery over the 20th century that they've tried to extract this oil and make it uh, uh, viable. Uh, one of the things that we did on this trip as well was to visit neighboring indigenous uh, reservations um, uh, in Canada. So these are, um, uh, it's sort of Canada's form of apartheid in, in, in many sense that, that uh, there's an attempt to uh, bring indigenous uh, uh, communities uh, uh, through uh, treaties and other types of means. But in, in reality, over the course of most of the 20th century, uh, people have been dispossessed of land and uh, where there are millions of dollars being made uh, through oil sands that there's generally massive forms of underdevelopment all around it, pipeline detritus and other forms. Um, and we spent uh, 
as we move through uh, parts of the community, what uh, one of the, the people said, this is Lubicon territory that we're in about an hour and a half, uh, about, sorry, about four hours to the west of Fort Mac, and we also visited Jean Vier Reserve. Uh, and this uh, a connection of trying to understand where indigenous, three, over 300 million indigenous uh, people in the world, and in various ways, whether uh, we're talking about Australia or other parts of the world, parts of Africa, where a state and ideas around development are being pushed in a way that are dispossessing people of land, but in fact, people are living in harmony with nature. And so how do we think about this um, other form of, of development today? Uh, that ecology cannot mean domination and extractivism, and it cannot have exploitation shot through all of our relations. That uh, ecological uh, change has to include social change, uh, part and parcel of it. <coughs> the new modern traditions today need to define freedom through equality, through differentiation and complexity, and through a relationship with land and other than human beings. And in so doing, we can recover a reconstituted understanding of the sweetness of living uh, might mean today. We have that title, The Sweetness of, of Living, because it, it actually was originally used by uh, Alexander uh, Kojev uh, following the Second World War, when he was theorizing uh, Europe uh, after the war, due to the uh, kind of sweetness of living, the right to define life as something outside of work, the slowness of time. And more recently, Giorgio Agamben, the Italian uh, political philosopher, when the economic crisis was unfolding, uh, was kind of cheekily uh, saying that there might need to be time for a kind of new Latin empire that comprised the southern states of uh, Italy and Spain and Greece uh, in relation to northern Europe, uh, because it actually was a different, there's not one European culture, but that this culture in the south was very different, and this right to define life as something outside of work, the difference in time, and the relationship to capitalism and development was very different. Uh, and so this is the kind of idea we're trying to tease through. We try and place these people who are from the radical continental tradition, Elaine Badiou, Giorgio Agamben, uh, who aren't really known as ecological philosophers, and put them in conversation with uh, indigenous traditions and worldviews and see where that uh, conversation can become uh, interesting. It can be a problematic thing to put continental philosophers in relation to uh, indigenous ways of thinking. There's histories of colonialism that come from Europe that make it problematic, but I think this is what's at stake uh, in the conversation. We combine that uh, with uh, interviews with uh, contemporary indigenous thinkers like uh, Glenn Coulthard and Leanne Simpson, and I think uh, in, in uh, those uh, uh, interviews you see a lot of commonality that's going to emerge. One of the things that happened uh, over the course of our trip, of course, unforeseen uh, circumstances. Uh, we were there in 2015, and the following year there was a massive fire that uh, went through uh, Fort McMurray, Alberta, so a lot of our interviews became stale, and uh, we um, uh, went back to talk to people. And uh, once again, you know, very interesting stories about people going away. It's very easy to go into media or social media to say, look, Fort McMurray is destroying the planet, and now because of global warming, the fire has swept through the city. And once again, that's not uh, the, 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 the story we were trying to tell. We were trying to get a sense of where people were at when their uh, lives are in, in peril by these situations that come through. Of course, uh, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, said in the early 20th century that you know capitalism is both religion and destruction. And in some senses, in, in Fort McMurray and in other places, uh, you can you can you can feel some of that uh, commentary. Um, I'm going to just read a little piece of it. This is a guy named uh, Dennis, who is from uh, Jean Vie Reserve, an Indigenous guy. Um, we met his niece uh, as part of um, our trip, and um, they're about an hour and a half from Fort McMurray, Alberta, where the median income for families is about $190,000. Vancouver, where I'm from, it's about $70,000. And this reserve that is generally uh, very close to people making a lot of money, but because this isn't a shared uh, enterprise, these are largely people living you know, far below the poverty line, very close to it. It's kind of the shame of Canada in many ways. So I'm just going to read a section where we, we, we visited with uh, Dennis and Melissa. The next day we met Melissa Herman. Melissa is a remarkable Diné organizer who seemingly holds, Diné is a, one of the indigenous nations in that area, uh, 
It seemingly holds 35 separate jobs in town, although it's probably only a half a dozen or so. She's constantly on the move, working at the homeless shelter, connecting people to the Salvation Army, feeding elders at the Friendship Center, taking care of her daughter, and mediating a swarm of community issues, some minor, many not. A lot of Melissa's time and energy is devoted to Jean Vier, the reserve about 120 kilometers southeast of town where much of her extended family lives. On Saturday, we drove out with Melissa and her aunt Diane. About halfway out, we encountered two young moose right in the middle of the highway. We were moving at a good clip, and Melissa had to jam on the brakes and fishtail onto the shoulder to avoid them. The two animals leapt in opposite directions, charging into the bush on either side of the road, with all gangly legs, fat horns, and stomping hooves disappearing in seconds. Melissa was jacked about it. She hadn't seen a moose that season, and her family had yet to shoot one. In absence, they were starting to get anxious about it. She leapt out of the car and got on her phone immediately, regretting she didn't have a gun with her, amazed at what had happened, laughing and hooting. We spent a full day in John V, and it was easily our favorite day of that trip. Melissa had really wanted us to meet her Uncle Dennis, but he was hardly the only one at home. We arrived to the warmest welcome possible and settled into smoking and drinking coffee in the kitchen, cracking jokes and telling stories. Kids and cousins, aunts and sisters kept rolling through the little house, happily greeting us and making us feel at home. Dennis talked about the season's hunting, showed us photos, and told us about their family. Soon we were in his truck, bouncing through dirt bush roads with Auntie Diane, Melissa, and the kids in lawn chairs in the back. Dennis drove, pointing out important spots on their land, showing us eagles, bear, and wolf tracks, and taking us past camps and fishing spots, trap lines, and cabins. We stopped several times to pick buckets of blueberries. We'd be driving along, and Dennis would pull up suddenly and point at the undergrowth. We didn't see much, but in minutes, we were all fanned out, kneeling and squatting, clutching yogurt containers, and trying to not to eat more than we collected. At three or four places, we parked and gathered around for Dennis to show us pools of clear, fresh water bubbling up in covert spots, filtered through the musket. We dipped cups into the little oases, feeling like we'd shared in a secret, and the water tasted earthly clean like moss and bush. After a long, slow, frequently pausing drive, we stopped beside a lake, perfect and peaceful, white pelicans floating offshore, fish jumping, and the fire pit already prepped. We cooked steaks and baked potatoes and rolled on the grass after stuffing ourselves with too much food. An uncle walked over from a cabin down shore and regaled us with expansive stories of his love life. All the while, Dennis showed us, talked to us about the land. He kept repeating how lucky he was to live this life. He spends as much time on the land as possible, hunting and fishing, gathering blueberries and medicinal herbs. It's all around him, right beside his door. He remarked to us several times how richly satisfied he felt. It was impossible to listen to Dennis, not think about the other parts of our drive to the lake, because it wasn't just berries and musket water we had stopped to look at. It was also pipelines, signs of pipelines to come. Pipeline to try this bush roughly cleared for pipelines, working in abandoned pipeline equipment. Remnants and reminders everywhere of the oil and gas industry, the carelessness, the intrusiveness, the virulence was grossly redolent of Lubicon territory. We saw so many pipelines around John Vier running beside the road, one after the other. Everywhere we drove, far off the reserve and deep into the bush, still the presence of the industry was everywhere. It just never stopped. Oil dominates everything in northern Alberta, and capital cannot, will not leave anywhere alone, especially when it's indigenous land. When Dennis and Melissa spoke about industry, they were by turns sanguine, infuriated, and designed, and mostly all of those things and a whole lot more. Dennis kept wondering, when is enough is enough? Later in the afternoon, talking about a set of signs we'd seen that promised more pipelines to come, he looked across the fire and said, they're getting ready to make us nothing. Why not just bomb us now and get it over with? We asked Melissa whether she thought much about development, and she replied, that was not a word we used. When I see a word like development being used, it's exclusively talking about industry. Melissa, in so many ways, lives the tensions that lurk throughout this book. She told us that people didn't like to like to hear her talk about global warming in Fort McMurray. They immediately position her as biased against industry. They ask her, whose side are you on anyway? Melissa lives in town but gets challenged when she tries to balance her life in Fort McMurray with her life on her reserve. People mock her desires to share a traditional life with her family and daughter. For Melissa, carrying on traditions like picking berries and hunting moose is part of thinking long terms. She says she can talk about sustainability with industry, but what difference will that make to her relatives in Jean Vier, who in industry is willing to talk about decolonization?
when I go north of town, I find myself physically and emotionally drained when I see the effects of industry in the land. I'm more interested in preserving the traditional way of living. And in some sense, as we went off to talk as well, and this is just one Canadian example, um, when we talk about the sweetness of life, we had a chance in the book as well to interview Alberto Acosta, the former uh, Minister of Mines in Ecuador, who came up with very interesting notions of how to keep oil in the ground that um, uh, because of the environmental implications of uh, the oil in Ecuador, they were actually putting forward proposals about transitional funding to um, leave oil in the ground. These are very interesting ideas that are coming out of the global south that the global north can actually uh, learn from, as crazy as it sounds. We do have uh, certain uh, governments like in Costa Rica where they're running on zero uh, uh, emissions into the future. These are political programs that still need to be actualized and they're running on utopian uh, big ideas. And certainly where uh, big states are not uh, acting in, in the United States where you see a, a move away from uh, addressing climate change at the national level, you certainly at the government and the city levels are seeing profound changes uh, being uh, brought forward. And so there's certainly uh, a lot of hope there. I'm not going to get too much into Anthropocene or what post-development might look like. Most of that is covered uh, in the book, and I don't think we land on something that's something like a solution, but we're trying to trace out by speaking with pe different people about what the outlines of that might look like. Um, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that for now.